I used to be a musician. Then I became a software developer after getting my degree in computer science, moved into product management, became a direct consumer brand consultant. And now I'm head of marketing for an e-commerce platform that ships sales globally. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Strategy Show. I'm Simon Severino, your host. This episode is brought to you by The Strategy Sprints. The Strategy Sprints do exactly one thing, strategy in sprints. Strategy means growing your predictable monthly revenue and aggressively dominating market shares. In sprints means doing that with fast execution cycles and short project cycles that start quickly and quickly so that you can measure progress every week and your teams have more energy and more willingness to do the next sprint. I am super pumped that today we have Marco Morandis here. Hi, Marco. Hey, how are you doing? He's the head of marketing at Elliot and he has so much experience as an entrepreneur. He is really good at building products that people love and he learned so much about entrepreneurship. We will cover two things. We will talk about the future of branding and we will talk about growth strategies and especially collaborations as one form of the growth strategy. Hi, Marco. Can you tell a little bit of your context, who you are, what you're creating right now? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I'm Marco Marindiz. I am the co-founder and head of marketing at Elliot. Um, I come from a quite varied background. I used to be a musician. Then I became a software developer after getting my degree in computer science, moved into product management, became a direct consumer brand consultant. And now I'm head of marketing for an e-commerce platform that ships sales globally uh, for anybody. You can get up and running very quickly. So my whole experience is mostly in tech, uh, but in varied capacities there. So I've seen uh, the very technical side, I've seen the very high level strategic side at companies of thousands of employees at very small startups. So um, my experience, I think, is pretty interesting. It gives me, it gives me a unique perspective for sure. You want to make your sales more repeatable and reliable? Do you want to have less volatility and more growth in your revenue per month? At Strategy Sprints, we do only one thing, strategy and sprints. Strategy means having more revenue through a better offer. And sprints means having more energy in your team every week. Check out if your ROI is as high as it is for most service-based and online businesses and startups we work with, which is over 100%. You can see it in just 15 minutes by going to strategysprints.com slash sales and completing our online exercise to know what your ROI would be with our accelerator program. We are ready to sprint. Are you? What I love about your first transition from music to products is that you said you went into products because you wanted the iterative approach mm -hmm. and music when, when, when you did five years of hip hop, you cannot just move to jazz. But, uh, but in product, you can improve it. You can make it better and better and better and better. You can pivot. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, when I was 17, I graduated from high school and I thought, okay, I need to follow my passions, which I think every young person needs to do. So I moved to LA, uh, started pursuing music. I wanted to be a rapper and a singer and a producer. And I played a bunch of instruments, but the challenge for me was that I was making music that, I mean, I spend a lot of time producing songs and at the end of it, you go show up to somebody and they say, uh, yeah, you know, hip hop's not really my thing or R&B is not really my thing. And you, you can't really show somebody the same song twice if they didn't like it the first time. And that was a challenge for me is that uh, I was in, like investing all this time into building songs and albums that nobody wanted to hear unless it hit perfectly the first time, which is great. I mean, honestly, it's an amazing skill and talent. And like, obviously those people that are very successful are iterating in different ways. I couldn't see the iterative cycle in my music journey. Um, maybe I was young, maybe I was unfocused, that's okay. Um, but as I started being exposed to engineering, like some of my friends were doing their master's degrees already. Some of them were teaching classes, online courses for computer science. And I thought, okay, let me try this. 
and I did really well really quickly on them. Um, and I thought, okay, let me go into this direction because it was still creative. It was still a way to build things and connect with people. But when you gave something to somebody, there was a problem I was trying to solve and I could put a solution in front of them that I could continue improving over time. I didn't have that, uh, I didn't really know how to do that in music, but taking that mindset and seeing the, the big uh, opportunity in an iterative uh, profession made it really easy to go from uh, engineering into product management, into consulting. I, I just saw iteration and opportunity in so many ways that I think, um, from my background, I had a new perspective on where you can iterate, where other people that I was working with might have had a more strictly defined version of that. Maybe the version of iteration that you get from the lean startup, which is not wrong, but it's a very specific perspective on how iteration works. And I have a broader understanding personally. I can understand the deep desire for iterations. And I had the same thing um, in younger years. So my, my first decades of work were just consulting. So doing a service. And at some point, I felt there is no way to iterate this. My, my deep desire was, today I would call it the scalability of it, but at that time, my deep desire was, can I build something where every day I make it better, a little bit better, 1% better. With love, I curate this part, I curate this part, I make this better, I bring water here, I bring some food here, I make it better and better and better. Imagine if you do that every day, 10 years later, what a beautiful work of art mm -hmm. in business you have created. What a wonderful product it could be. Mm -hmm. So my, my deep desire went from delivering services to creating a consulting company, which then can become this work of art and can have programs and modules that you can make better every day. So it has products in it. So there are services, there are products, and there are hybrids. And, and this changed everything. So I understand the, the iterative approach so well. And there are more things about your approach that I love so much. One is you say the brand needs a face. Mm -hmm. there, there is so many brands where you don't know the CEO. Mm -hmm. so who's the CEO of this company? Uh, yes. Why does a brand need to have a face? Well, I think this is a relatively new phenomenon, I'd say in, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to speak for the past, but I'm looking at from my experience in my career and what I've seen as trying, in trying to build brands, help brands grow. Uh, I think business has always been kind of at an arm's length for, from society. People engage with them, but they're not really connected to them in any meaningful way. And the brands that we've seen, the businesses that we've seen that have faces to them, always are the ones at the forefront of innovation. They're the ones that are most well known. So we know Bill Gates, we know Elon Musk, um, we know Reed Hastings, we know Mark Zuckerberg. These are people that have faces, not necessarily that they are the best representation of what they wanna be for their brand, but they are well known and they are not afraid to be personally responsible for the products and services they put forward with their business. And I think this creates a great opportunity. Now, if you've seen this in traditional, traditional technology, so things from the 70s or 80s coming full circle. So like Steve Jobs is actually like the pinnacle example in this, right? He is fully personally responsible for the quality of his products that he was delivering at Apple. But that makes a personal connection for every customer says, oh, I know Steve Jobs designed this. Now, personally, he did not design most of the aspects of any of the technology we use today, even when he was around, um, but this, this idea that I'm connected with a person and their, their work is, is trying to connect with me in a meaningful way makes my relationship with the products more meaningful as well. And we see this a lot more in modern branding if you see uh, direct consumer businesses, digitally native brands, all of them, their brand has a personality, but many of their founders are front and center as well. They're making themselves known, they're personally accountable for that, and they want to connect on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with their customers. This is important because you're putting um, your customers first in the most meaningful ways. The most powerful people at the company are, are putting themselves right next to their customers every single day. This helps a lot of community building. It helps you understand your customers better. It helps you iterate more quickly. 
you, you're building evangelists at every step. And so, yeah, like I, I said this, I think mean, I said this before, but essentially like Shopify is a huge business and there's nothing wrong that Shopify doesn't have a face to it. It is Shopify. And if I ask most people that work on their businesses using Shopify, most people wouldn't know who the CEO of Shopify is. I might because I work in this industry, but for a multi-billion dollar company for their CEO to kind of shy away from the limelight, um, doesn't speak poorly on him. It just speaks to the way that their type of business connects with their industry. And it tends to maybe be more of a B2B um, traditional marketing channel. And I, I think that it's important that brands um, kind of have some sense of unpredictability because they're human, not because they're un they're irrational actors, but that they are human. And I, uh, there's something unique about the way that they engage with me that makes me want to work with them versus the next company. So um, per like personality in a brand is important, but people being, there to represent your business every day as a face of it, being comfortable being out there, I think is very important going forward. Uh, this model is actually not just seen in tech or branding, which I think is relatively uncommon in, um, in business, in consumer packaged goods, direct, direct consumer, any other traditional business. But we see this in music a lot. Actually, we see it everywhere in music. <laughs> All musicians have faces and all of them put their work on the line with their own face. They're fully responsible for that, but they become the biggest stars. They are cultural icons. And I don't think we make that connection is that the people who put faces to their work become cultural icons, have significant amount of influence, even if they don't have that financial influence on the economy. So if you have a business that can actually have financial influence and you have a face as represented, Think about the cultural influence you can have with a company that might be worth billions of dollars. The only billions of dollars companies that I know in music are Kanye, Diddy, Jay-Z, Beyonce. That's a few, but they're, but they're basically just breaking the billion dollar mark. But there are multi-billion dollar tech companies, multi-billion dollar brands that could be having a, even a much greater cultural influence if um, there were people that there are individuals that represented the brand well. Beautiful. I was running yesterday while listening to your hypothesis about that. And today in the morning we had a team meeting and we asked ourselves this question, what can we do to become even more relatable, mm -hmm. even more human, even more tangible, even more approachable to have a more direct relation to the people we care about and we serve? And one idea was, what about we make our own product roadmap public? Meaning, we have a fancy product roadmap where we say, okay, that's the next sprint, that's the next sprint. We are going to ship this next week. We are going to ship this in May. And we said, what about we make it public? And, and they said, Simon, and you regularly on Facebook, in our community, in your mastermind, you regularly talk about it. Like what went wrong, what, what did we do, what, what were, are we accountable for doing next? It, it will raise our accountability. It, it will share the journey with everybody. And it makes everything uh, human and, and interesting and, and open and it becomes a journey, right? And who's interested yeah. in the journey can be part of the journey. We all know that working in sprints is better but how do we know what we should work on? You're in luck because we have a 15 minute exercise that will give you complete clarity on where to take your project next. Go to strategysprints.com slash sales to complete our short exercise and meet one-on-one -on -one with an expert sprint coach to identify your number one bottleneck. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the strategy show. Make sure to like this video below and subscribe so that you can stay up to date with every episode of The Strategy Show. Get daily CEO tips from CEOs for CEOs.